In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom, dear friend. This is wonderful to be able to be with you today. Welcome to the In the Last Days TV program. My name is Natalie Blackham, and I have the joy today to have Dr. Pamela Pellet with us. And she's going to speak about her book, which is called For the Love of God and the Virgin. So, Pamela was born in South Africa, and she grew up in a sun-drenched land, brimming with swimming pool and tender tibun sex on charcoal fires. There was no television, and pupils were ken by forgetting their homework. Nelson Mandela was still in jail. At 17, Pamela, which is very young, she came, left home, and went to Jerusalem to study English literature at the Hebrew University. After completing the MA, she taught for many years, and then she did a PhD in literature in Bar Ilan. Now, know that Bar Ilan is just uh, next to Tel Aviv. She's a journalist. She contributes to the Jerusalem Post, and she's the health editor of Ezra magazine. Pamela lectures in the uh, IDC, which is Interdisciplinary Center in Ertilia. Again, Ertilia is on the Mediterranean Sea in the north of Tel Aviv, just for you to know. And she's, she also gives some uh, lectures in Beth Bird College in Israel. She gives guest lectures in Europe, England, and in America, and also She's been in South Africa to speak about her book. And somewhere else, Canada. Canada, yes. She had a study course in Stratford, no, sorry, in Stratford upon Avon. This is like so English name for me. <laughs> um, and she loves lecture, uh, to lecture about uh, Shakespeare, which is like one of her best of subjects. And uh, she wrote a book on life and literature, which is called How to Have a Husband and live with your lover at the same time. This is an interesting book. But now she's coming today to speak about her book, which is For the Love of God and Virgin. She, this book examines living in Israel, not touring in Israel, living in Israel, and copying with a sometimes distorted way the rest of the world view what goes on in the Middle East. Now, Pamela, thank you again for coming. And tell us a bit, you know, what brings you to write this book and what was your journey to to arrive at this point? Well, I've lived in Israel, as you said, since I was 17. Mm -hmm. And I've been a journalist, and I lived, I've lived here through a lot of good times and a lot of troublesome times. And I noticed, especially in the Second Intifada, that the foreign news media was not presenting a fair picture of Israel. Mm -hmm. I felt that, um, and I've got plenty of examples in the book, whatever Israel did, we were always presented as the aggressor and the, to blame for what's mm -hmm. going on. And I thought that this simply isn't fair. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, you know, having lived in Israel for such a long time, I've experienced a lot of the stuff that goes on here. When I was quite a young student, I shared a flat in Jerusalem with a really wonderful guy. Um, mm -hmm. His name was Eli Miron. He was my flatmate. And he was doing his PhD in archaeology. And he was a peace-loving man. He belonged to the movement Peace Now. Mm -hmm. And this was just at the time when Sadat came to Israel. Mm -hmm. And Israel opened, Egypt opened up for the first time to Israelis. Mm -hmm. And Eli used to take trips to um, Egypt. Mm -hmm. And he always used to say to me, you, you must come with me. It's the most beautiful country and it's so interesting. And I was always teaching or, or working. And I, I always used to say, I'll come next time. And anyway, then he got married and I got married. Mm -hmm. And when I was pregnant with my second child, mm -hmm. so that was about 24 years ago, mm -hmm. we were driving back from Elat, my husband and my mother and I mm -hmm. in the car, and we heard a breaking news flash that there'd been a terrible terrorist attack in mm -hmm. Egypt. And terrorists had stormed the bus and just started shooting indiscriminately, and many people had been killed. Mm -hmm. And I said to my husband, that's Ellie. And my husband said to me, you know, there's thousands Many. of Israelis. There doesn't have to be Eli, but it was. 
and afterwards eyewitnesses told us what had happened and you know he spoke perfect Arabic mm -hmm. and he got off the bus apparently and he said to the terrorists you know we've come here in peace to your beautiful country and we've come to spend our money here and we've come to understand you and we've come in love we your friends mm -hmm. and they put a gun to his temple and just shot him dead and of course I was devastated he was one of my closest friends mm -hmm. but I felt that that side is n that side what Israelis suffer you know mm -hmm. that side of the story is never portrayed in the foreign mm -hmm. media we are always portrayed as the ones who are causing all the trouble so I decided to write a book Mm -hmm. I called the book for the love of God and virgins. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted, absolutely wanted to give my book a provocative title for a specific reason. I wanted people to go into a bookshop and pick it up and say, mm -hmm. I wonder what this is about. Mm -hmm. That looks interesting and not connected to Israel in any way because I wanted people to read it who would otherwise not read about Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the title alludes, of course, to suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. They blow themselves up for the love of God. And also there's this heinous crime, I think, mm -hmm. that these young suicide bombers who don't know any better are told by their leaders and by their religious leaders that if they blow themselves up and if they take many Israelis and Jews along with them when they die, then when they get to heaven, there'll be 72 virgins waiting to mm -hmm. give them a good time. Mm -hmm. and. I just I think Shall this I is such an unbelievably awful thing mm -hmm. to do to anyone um, to give them this kind sure. of a problem. Now this is interesting because I see in the media, even in the UK, it's like people know a bit about these things, but the thing that they don't know, and I love when you speak about it, and in your book you are saying, um, I think, let me find, I don't like journalists. And I love when you say that because you are journalists and you wrote, you wrote the book and and we are journalists too. Um, but journalists can want their stories and they don't care too much about the humanity behind, behind the story that they are writing. I think that, I, first of all, of course, I like journalists. I am a journalist. Mm -hmm. But I think that journalists have a huge responsibility. Journalists, in fact, are the people who... Sh I don't know whether it's right to say that they shape history, but they certainly shape the way that people view history, mm -hmm. especially what's going on, what's unfolding in our world today. Mm -hmm. Journalists present history and they present it with their agenda mm -hmm. um, often. Mm -hmm. And this is history's sort of first draft, you mm -hmm. know. And if journalists are biased and they present, their, they skewer the facts, especially in today's world where you can Photoshop pictures and, and you, can, you, yeah. know, you can do all kinds of things mm -hmm. to, to change the truth. But even if you don't change the truth, mm -hmm. you don't have to change the truth. You can just present it in a particular way. For example, there was a story, um, there was a terrible incident in Israel where a family was driving back from a wedding and mm -hmm. the terrorists opened fire on the family and the, the husband and wife were killed. And... Uh, the terrorists escaped into Hebron mm -hmm. and three days later due to a lot of intelligence work on the part of the Israeli army the army surrounded this house in mm -hmm. Hebron and called on the terrorists to surrender and they didn't so the army opened fire when you say Hebron in Hebrew we say Hebron just Hebron. for you to know that <laughs> to make sure yes yeah. and the terrorists didn't surrender so the army opened fire and in the ensuing gun battle two terrorists were killed and one was captured and the news media in England mm -hmm. presented this, this development, mm -hmm. this story, as last night the Israeli army surrounded a house in Hebron, in, in Hebron, killing three Palestinians, killing two Palestinians and capturing a third. So the way the story was presented sounded as though, on a whim, the Israeli army had walked into a, an Arab city, surrounded three men who were harmlessly sleeping in their beds mm -hmm. and shot to it makes the Israelis sound as though they're absolute monsters and when the the journalists were challenged mm -hmm. and they were asked why didn't you say that these people who were shot had three days before opened fire on a passing car and killed and a man and a woman yeah. coming back from a wedding why was this left 
completely out of the report? And the answer was that this is a developing story and our listeners know the background to the story. But of course, if you turn on your radio in a little town in England or anywhere in the world, you're not going to know the connection no. between the terrorists. No. And so this is what I say, you know, these, I, I, I'm not saying and I would never say that the journalists lie mm -hmm. or willingly distort the facts. But just the way the facts are presented often gives a very distorted picture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not fair. I think mm -hmm. that's actually a huge reason that Israel's in many places so hated today in the world. Mm -hmm. It's because day after day, drip by drip, they fed this poison against Israel, mm -hmm. which is not not fair. Mm -hmm. It's because of that we are trying to give and to have you and try to bring a bit of, you know, different different stories. But this is very interesting because again we live now, it's about our third year to live here. We live through events and we were there and suddenly we came back here switch on the television, which I think it was ITV, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was ITV, and they were reporting of what we've seen, and it was like, this is not what, this is not the truth. But it's not a lie. As you said, they were saying facts, but they, they weren't giving all the facts around the story. So they were, you know how it is, you like, you have your camera, you give a shot there, but there is a lot of things all around, uh, which is very interesting because I saw also another picture and it was uh, somebody who was um, doing something. Oh, I think you spoke also about it and, and I saw also the picture. The, the picture is going around and you could see uh, a soldier and Joseph like Grossman. he's ready to... Tovia Grossman. Yeah. That was an interesting story. Yeah. There was a... a an iconic photo which was broadcast all over the world about a brutal, with a brutal Israeli soldier standing with a truncheon in his hand and a bleeding, ostensibly Palestinian young kid mm -hmm. battered and bleeding at the soldier's knees, mm -hmm. which, and obviously the, the message was, look at these brutal monsters that beat these poor defenseless Palestinian kids. And this photograph was sent all over the world until a man in Chicago, a Mr. Grossman, opened the photo, opened the newspaper and said, that's my son, Tuvia Grossman. Tuvia Grossman was an American student who was studying in Jerusalem at a yeshiva um, and he was in, the, in a car mm -hmm. a few years ago when he was brutally pulled from the car by a mob of, of Palestinian sort of stone-throwing youth and they beat him up to a pulp and he managed to crawl away mm -hmm. to where he saw an Israeli soldier and the Israeli soldier who I think was armed but didn't use his gun mm -hmm. to protect himself mm -hmm. but picked up his club to say to the mob of stone throwers don't come any mm -hmm. closer mm -hmm. and he was protecting Tuvia Grossman so that's a typical story of how the facts can totally be turned mm -hmm. upside down and Another thing that I would like to sure, sort of discuss, sure. if I may, is this yes. is this very, it's ubiquitous now, it's all over the world. We, mm -hmm. we hear this claim that Israel is an apartheid state. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a new mantra. It used to be always, the mantra would always be, it's because of the occupation, it's because mm -hmm. of the occupation. And the new mantra seems to be that Israel is an apartheid state. And I feel that I'm really perfectly positioned um, to oh, dispute to that explain, to dispute that claim mm -hmm. because I come from South Africa. Mm -hmm. I grew up under apartheid, mm -hmm. and Israel is as far from an apartheid state as you could hope to mm -hmm. come. I, it, with your permission, I'll just yes, read. Of course, of course. Um, I. You know, when people talk to me about apartheid, I can say I was there, I know mm -hmm. what apartheid mm -hmm. is. When I was growing up in South Africa, if a black man raped a white woman, the punishment was death by hanging. If a white man raped a black woman, the punishment was not being able to boast about it. Sexual relations across the color bar were banned. When I was growing up, the buses in South Africa were smart double-deckers. Blacks sat upstairs, whites below. But whites had cars, they hardly ever went by bus. And then I continue saying how that the buses used to come empty and blacks couldn't get in because they had to go upstairs. 
When I was growing up in South Africa, there were two doors to the post office and two doors to the bank. One was for Europeans, though most whites had never set foot in Europe, and the other was for non-Europeans, blacks, coloreds and Indians. If a black was born in Belgium, say, and for some reason had to visit Johannesburg, he would discover to his horror that he was a non-European. Americans, Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, anyone with a white skin was an honorary European too, at least in South Africa. My parents, who were born there in South Africa, were Europeans. Their parents had fled their native Europe when it became a dangerous place for Jews to live. Cossacks were killing Jews across the country. My grandparents didn't want to be European. They waded across wide Lithuanian rivers and stowed away in ships, traveling for weeks to escape the pogroms of Eastern Europe so that their kids could be born African and be free. Mm -hmm. But we were all European in Africa and it was lucky that we were. In Africa, Africans weren't free. And then I go on to describe what apartheid was. Um, it was illegal to have a drink with the black. It was illegal to go to a movie with the black. It was illegal to play on the same sports team as a black. It was illegal to hold hands with a black unless the hand was attached to your nanny and you were five years old and crossing the road. It was illegal for blacks to criticize their country. Some did and were arrested and beaten up. Many of them amazingly fell out of windows from the top floor of prisons. Windows that were usually locked and barred. It happened in Port Elizabeth where I grew up and the policeman used to say, I just don't understand it. They just suddenly upped and fell out of the window. Apartheid meant that there were separate hospitals mm -hmm. for blacks and whites, except that the blacks hardly got their own hospitals. There was separate education for blacks and whites. But most important, of course, blacks could not vote. There was one man, one vote for whites. But blacks absolutely couldn't didn't exist almost in the, didn't in the political system now when you say that israel is an apartheid state it's so laughable that you just don't know where to start refuting these these lies when i gave birth to my children i lay in the hospital and next door to me in the bed next door was an arab woman from tira down the road having her baby but more than that the doctor was an arab and the nurses were arabs the arabs in state Beryl where i teach my students are Israeli, Jewish, Christian, and Arabs. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers are Jewish, Christian, and Arabs. There's no apartheid in mm -hmm. Israel. And what obviously, I just must yeah. say this, obviously Arabs can vote. Mm -hmm. Arabs who live in Israel can vote, and they have an equal vote to me, to, mm -hmm. uh, to us, to everybody. One man, one vote. They're Arab members of Knesset. They're Arab mm -hmm. members of parliament. They're Arab ministers. They're a there's an Arab who sits on the Supreme Court. And more than that, I think Israel's probably one of the most vibrant democracies in the whole world. Some people say we're mad. Arab members of parliament, um, Khana Zuabi, mm -hmm. um, can get up and, and almost call for the destruction of Israel from mm -hmm. Israel's parliament. She was on the Mavi Marmara. She mm -hmm. recently almost implied or actually said that Israel was to blame for the bombing, the bus yes. bombing mm -hmm. in Europe. And she's allowed to say this. You know, some people say that it's crazy that Israel allows all this anti-Israel speech from Arab members of parliament mm -hmm. in the parliament. And, and I'm not sure that it's crazy. I think that I'm very proud to live in such a hugely vibrant democracy. Mm -hmm. If you are strong, you don't need to be afraid in one way. And I think Israel I think is strong. I think it shows strong. that Israel is, a, mm -hmm. is the most vital, vibrant mm -hmm. democracy in the world. And in the Middle East is the only one. And in the Middle East it's the only one. And that's when you think of what's going on in Syria today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you think of and how long it's been going on mm -hmm. for, and where does all the criticism in the news media comes on, on, a, on a building a, a house in Gilo, building a building in Gilo, where's, where's the outrage at what's going on in Syria? It goes on and on. The, the stories, mm -hmm. you know, the to, rem to remind you, uh, Gilu is a place in Jerusalem, is an area in Jerusalem. So it's like obviously Jerusalem is growing. By the way, Jerusalem is bigger than Tel Aviv. <laughs> the inhabitants is, I think, almost close to a million, already a million. And of course, it's going to grow because it's like a young country and people are coming. So it's, it's just wonderful to see that. But it's like 
we need to carry on being able to bring this news for people to start, you know, to see that what they are listening on the main media is not the truth. Now, can we go a bit deeper and why, why do they claim that Israel is an apartheid? How did it start? I think that Israel is the, the punching bag. Yeah. I, think yeah. I think we're getting into issues here that I'm not sure that we, we really want to discuss. I think that um, Israel, the anti-Israel sentiment is the new anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. I think that it's not really politically correct anymore to say, you know, I hate all Jews. Mm -hmm. So I think that Israel has become, so I hate that Israel the hatred has been transferred mm -hmm. to Israel. I think I, 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 I'm not sure that I want to delve mm -hmm. too much mm -hmm. into that, but Israel is, is so single, so unfairly singled out that mm -hmm. it's become almost, almost ridiculous. Mm -hmm. In London, I think to, I think uh, in honor, in commemoration of Shakespeare's 400th birthday, I think mm -hmm. that was the reason, mm -hmm. but whatever the reason was, they had a, a festival on at the Globe Theatre. Mm -hmm. um, my book, by the way, begins William Shakespeare is buried in Jerusalem because and he is, and you have mm -hmm. to read the book to find out how that's, that's a true fact. It is true, <laughs> yes. Um, but because Shakespeare was the master of spin, Shakespeare could spin facts in, in accordance with an agenda. Um, but so now 37 countries were invited to come and perform at the Globe, mm -hmm. to perform a a, a pl one of his 37 plays in the language of the country. Mm -hmm. So Israel was invited to perform A Merchant of Venice. And there was a huge, boyc not a huge, but there was an, an, an outcry in London. Mm -hmm. Emma Thompson, who we love, what a wonderful actress. She's one of my favorite actresses. She signed and spearheaded a petition not to allow Habima to come and perform mm -hmm. at the Globe Theatre because what was their crime? They perform over the green line, in, over the so-called green line in Ariel. Um, and so because of that, she, she and Mark Rylance, another actor, started a, a, I think it was that they started the protest, but they certainly signed it, um, a petition not to allow Israel to perform at the Globe. Let me no. tell us our, our people, again, you need to know Ariel is in Samaria, and Ariel has been recognized now as a university, full-fledged university in Israel. So this is like very good, but just for you to know that Ariel is in Samaria. So Ariel is across the green line. That's it. So that so okay. Now I say everybody, you know, can have their own political opinions. And if this is very important to Emma Thompson and the, the people who signed this petition, that's fair enough. But at the Globe, the other participants who were invited included China, mm -hmm. with China's rather bad record of human rights. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a piss about China. Mm -hmm. Another country that was Nigeria, I think, was one of the countries invited, but I'm sure that Zimbabwe was invited. Mm -hmm. No protest whatsoever against Zimbabwe with the killings that go on and the torture and the total lack of, mm -hmm. of human rights mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe. So that's when I say you have to be, you have to be fair. You have to if you're going to protest always against one country, mm -hmm. that shows bias, in my yeah. opinion. And it's like, we need, and I think we might carry on doing things. People, we want to bring you more stories from Israel, real people, and that stop listening to the general media who are spinning the, uh, they are saying the things in their ways. They are very good, they were like Shakespeare. I like, I like it when you, say, when you speak about that. There's um, a strong connection. The yes. Mohammed Aldura case, for example, that iconic uh, little film clip, those seconds of film clip of Muhammad Aldura yeah. cowering under his father's arm while the Israelis ostensibly shot at him for 45 minutes. Many people have questioned the veracity of that film clip, including, of course, Philippe Carcenti yes. from France, yes. who has actually, if you listen to Philippe Carcenti, um, he's got it's very convincing proof yes. Yes. Uh, that that could possibly have yes. been, it, that the boy was not shot by Israelis. That seems definite. Yes. And that actually, perhaps, the whole story could have been a hoax. 
but the fact that he wasn't shot by Israeli troops seems pretty clear mm -hmm. if, if to anyone who goes and studies the facts. I, I won't go into that now, but it's from, they've done a lot of research on it, the angle of the bullets yep. and, and um, where the bullets hit the, mm -hmm. the water canister behind him and the fact that there was no blood and, and there, there's many, many um, facts to back this up. Mm -hmm. But of course, that story, that shot has mm -hmm. done the damage now. Exactly. You can stand on your head shouting that it isn't true. There's already Muhammad al Dura statues and I think there's a mosque called the Aldera and Mosque streets and streets, streets named after him. Mm -hmm. And people say, look what you did to Muhammad al-Dura, we can shoot your children, even though it's, it's not, it mm -hmm. didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it's a, very, it's a very difficult journey mm -hmm. to try and right the wrongs about mm -hmm. Israel. Noel, what do you want to say to all the viewers, the viewers today? What do you have in your heart to say for the last one minute. I say that Israel is a very complicated country, a very beautiful, a very wonderful, a very spiritual and marvelous place, but complicated. I'm not blind to the fact that Israel has faults. For sure, every con no country is perfect, and Israel is not the perfect country. But it's certainly no worse than all the countries that want our annihilation. And I truly believe that we, we hold ourselves to a much higher moral standard, but to always blame Israel and to always say that Israel is the party, is the root of all the problems in the region is simply unfair. I would invite you to come and see for yourselves, come and do some research, come and visit our country, come and visit the Palestinian past. See for yourself. Welcome. Thank you very much, Pamela, for coming and Thank speaking you. for Israel and what's happening here in Israel. And don't forget, friends, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you in two weeks, same time, same station, for the next program from In the Last Days.